The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. And in fact, I do intend to declare a recess probably around 4.15 p.m. to allow people to vote toward the end of the first vote on the floor and uh, resuming probably half an hour later so that people will have a chance to have voted on the second vote that we expect to happen this afternoon. Without objection, uh, members of the full committee who are not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing according to committee rules. This is the first markup of the 117th Congress, and uh, I do want to thank everyone for being here. And I'd like to point out that with the chair of our full committee being an ex officio member of this subcommittee, this subcommittee has four full committee chairs as members of this subcommittee, as we have the chairs of the financial services, uh, government uh, reform, agriculture, and uh, foreign affairs committees serving with us here today. As a reminder, uh, all members uh, keep themselves muted uh, when they're not recognized. This will minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. Uh, the staff has been instructed uh, not to mute a member except when the member is not recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you're participating uh, uh, today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. If members wish to be recognized during the hearing, please identify yourself by name to facilitate recognition. The, this hearing is uh, entitled uh, Climate Change Social Res and Social Responsibility, Keeping Boards of Directors and Invest Helping Boards of, of Directors and Investors Make Decisions for a Sustainable World. Uh, and uh, I've been just been informed that the uh, that uh, our chair Maxine Waters will not be joining us for an opening statement, and accordingly, I recognize myself uh, for uh, uh, five minutes to deliver an opening statement. I'll then recognize uh, the uh, ranking member of this subcommittee, uh, Mr. Heisinga, for his opening statement. For hundreds of years, boards of directors. Uh, and uh, investors have focused pretty much on one thing. Can the corporation pay dividends? The chief measure of this was earnings per share. The accounting profession for centuries has developed a system to define, measure, tabulate, audit, and report earnings per share. Those who define earnings per share controlled what a corporation would do since its um, board would instruct its executives to do whatever was was legal and ethical in order to achieve earnings per share. And this met societal expectations since society simply wanted corporations to create and maintain profitable businesses. Today, we have different expectations. In addition to shareholders, we have stakeholders. All of us are stakeholders. Society at large protects the corporation and its property, educates its workforce and their children. And stakeholders also want to know what is the corporation doing? And the shareholders themselves want more information than earnings per share. Uh, they especially want information about the effect on climate change. Keep in mind that over the last 40 years, the number of weather events costing over a billion dollars has increased by 300%. So climate change is real and it is affecting us. And we know who's affected most. It's disadvantaged communities and communities of color. For example, Hurricane Katrina, more than one third of those residents who are forced to leave their homes were African Americans, and half of those who died from that hurricane were African Americans. The uh, 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 so those looking at corporations want to know uh, how is the corporation affected by future climate change? How will it be affected? And how is its behavior uh, designed to minimize uh, climate change? 
we have a host of other social issues to deal with. And in, with each of them, we want to define numerical standards. We don't want an extra page or two added to the report of the corporation, the 10K, uh, where loaded with greenwash and uh, banal statements. We need to define and hopefully have numerical standards, measure and tabulate. Um, we want to change the behavior of corporations, uh, both in causing them to prepare for climate change and to hopefully minimize their effect uh, on climate change. And there are those who argue that this is not important. It's not material, that the only things that are material are things that change earnings per share by at least a few, uh, a, a few pennies. Um, first, these issues are material to shareholders. Second, there's a reputational risk that will affect earnings per share. So if you focus only on earnings per share, you are not going to be in a position to predict future earnings per share. And uh, investors themselves are interested in these social issues, not just uh, on earnings per share. Now we can't turn the Form 10K into a, a telephone book. We need to be selective. And sometimes issues may arise that are important that may not be uh, as important in future years. Right now, uh, I am uh, okay. working with others on getting disclosures of involvement in Xinjiang province in China. So we know whether forced labor is part of the corporation's uh, a supply chain. Hopefully 10 years from now, that won't be an issue. But we do know that climate change and the corporation's effect on other environmental issues and environmental justice will be important to stakeholders and shareholders in the future. We do know that we want to disclose whether the corporation is engaged in uh, political contributions that are hidden from the public, dark money. And for those who say that isn't material to investors, tell me on the record whether you'd invest in a company that gave $20 million to the uh, Communist Party of the United States. Uh, or one of its uh, one of its dark money uh, uh, subordinate entities. We want to uh, uh, focus on executive pay versus average pay, whether the corporation is paying taxes or whether it's taking advantage of tax havens. Uh, there are a host of issues that I think are serious enough to require the corporations uh, to disclose them and for shareholders to want to focus on them. With that, I recognize Mr. Heisinga for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, so what exactly are ESGs? Well, many claim that the ESG investing is an investment strategy that focuses on incorporating criteria into investment decisions, in addition to the traditional focus on investment financial returns. However, ESG data criteria span a range of issues, including, among others, uh, measures of companies' carbon emissions, labor policy. Mr. Heisinga, if you can suspend until uh, the majority of us can hear you. All right. Can you hear me now, Mr. Chairman? I'm not sure what's we can happening. Hear you now. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll pick up partway through, assuming that uh, that you're dealing with the timing properly to, uh, to put some time back on. Correct, Mr. Chairman? You have uh, almost four and a half minutes. All right. Well, this uh, this data spans a range of issues. Uh, deals with what are frankly policy decisions, uh, not business decisions. And you know whether the CEO and the chairman of the board of directors are the same person, or whether the company issues dual class shares, uh, shouldn't be the role of this body. So it's clear that demands for ESG information has increased recently. The amount of money in ESG specific exchange traded funds went from taking in 8 billion in 2019 to 31 billion in 2020. According to the Bank of America Global Research, it's estimated that the amount invested in ESG funds could increase by 20 trillion over the next two decades. 
because of these increased demands, many companies have responded by voluntarily increasing the amount of ESG information that they disclose. By all means, companies should focus on providing meaningful material disclosure that a reasonable investor needs to make informed investment decisions. After all, companies and not bureaucrats are best equipped to determine Once again, Mr. Heisinga, I wonder if you can suspend and I'll ask staff to freeze the clock. Um, I don't know. Can others hear Mr. Heisinga? I cannot. Let me. We've uh, frozen the clock at 317 and now we can uh, hear the gentleman. And now, I am. I'm trying to reconnect on my Bluetooth. I'm sorry, on the uh, trying to reconnect the internet, the Wi-Fi here. Make sure that that's connected properly. We can hear you now. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. We'll uh, hopefully the uh, the internet is. Uh, I'm in in my office. I can't do much more than be in my office to get a signal. So with that. Um, individual uh, individual businesses uh, should be able to create and optimize value for their shareholders and potential investors. Uh, what should not happen is that the government mandate ESG disclosures. As we had talked about, and maybe it got cut out, doing this voluntarily is proper. But having government mandates to do it should not be. These disclosures only name and shame companies that we all know for some, naming and shaming, what they perceive as corporate villains has been fun and trendy, and some even have profited from the practice. Additionally, compliance with these types of mandatory disclosures only waste precious private sector resources that could otherwise be used to create jobs, increase wages, grow the company, expand capacity, and maximize shareholder value. To date, there's very little concrete evidence that over the long term, ESG investing outperforms broad market indexes. Politically motivated disclosure requirements only increases costs and yet add another hurdle for companies who look to go public while discouraging other companies from doing so. Over the last several decades, activists, shareholders, corporate gadflies, and misguided politicians have hijacked the SEC to operate well outside its mandate and push non-material social and political policies. In fact, a February 2021 report from the Global Financial Markets Center at Duke Law goes so far as to say that securities law should be rewritten so that the SEC can regulate to fight, quote, climate change, systematic racism, and income and wealth inequality, close quote. This is not part of the tripartite mission of the SEC, and instead of focusing on policies that solve societal ills, the SEC must remain focused on protecting investors, maintaining fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. While some here today may encourage or even embrace SEC mission creep, the reality is government imposed mandates will not lead to greater prosperity or protect investors. At the end of the day, the goal should be to create an atmosphere that increases capital formation, strengthens job creation, and boosts economic growth. Talk about closing the gap on income and quality, that's how we do it. The committee should be looking for ways to make our public markets healthier, more attractive, and more competitive not examining ways to increase regulatory and compliance burdens with the private sector. Uh, this title says it's helping corporate bond, uh, boards and investors make decisions for a sustainable world. What this really is, because the chairman had said, quote, we want to change the behavior of corporations. This is not helping. This is mandating. And not all of us agree with where the chairman is. Some may have those different expectations. So it's amazing to me the mental gymnastics that are being used to justify this path forward. And uh, what we need to do is make sure that we are dealing with policy, not social and engineering, plain and simple. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Today, we uh, welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. Andy Green is a, a senior fellow for economic policy at the uh, Center for American Progress and was uh, uh, counsel to a former SEC Commissioner, Kara Stein. Uh, Heather McTeer uh, uh, Tony is an, environmental, uh, is an environmental justice liaison at the Environmental Defense Fund 
and a senior advisor at Moms Clean Air Force. Previously, uh, she served as mayor of Greensville, Mississippi, and regional administrator for the EPA's Southeast region. Uh, Virna Brahmani is uh, a uh, senior uh, director uh, at the, the cap of Capital Market Systems at Sirius, a sustainable nonprofit organization, sustainability nonprofit organization that works with investors and companies. Uh, uh, James Andrus is the uh, investment manager for uh, CalPERS, uh, has some of my money, and uh, I believe is the largest in institutional investor. And uh, 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 Vivek uh, Ramam, uh, Ram Aswamni is uh, founder and executive chairman of uh, Royven Sciences, and I believe he is also an, uh, an entrepreneur and author as well. Uh, witnesses are reminded uh, that your oral uh, uh, testimony will be limited to five minutes. Uh, you should be able to see the timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left and a chime will go off at the end of your time. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear a chime. Without objection, your written statement in full will be made part of the record. Mr. Green, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman Sherman and Ranking Member uh, Huzanga. Can you hear me? I am Andy Green, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. These remarks reflect my own views. The problems facing our world from climate change to systemic racism to economic inequality are problems that investors directly face too. Disclosure and accountability aren't about subjective values and preferences. They're about making the economy work. Information and accountability are the lifeblood of competition and the broadly distributed economic opportunity that makes capitalism, America, capitalism in America work if we hold true to it. Consistent, comparable, and reliable information together with corporate governance accountability tools and strong banking regulation enable investors and the public to help align outcomes for the long-term shared interests of all. Investors, companies, workers, and the public. When those outcomes are not so aligned, financial crises, corporate scandals, taxpayer bailouts, pollution, racism, and economic inequality occur far more easily. Climate change is a systemic risk to the U.S. financial system, and many ESG matters pose growing threats, in, in, including existing threats to investor protection, retirement security, and economic growth. Climate change will destroy assets and hamstring recovery and growth. The need to transition to net zero will leave behind those who are laggards. And as scholar Graham Steele has outlined, climate's impacts on the financial system amplify existing vulnerabilities, in particular, leverage, interconnectedness, and concentration. Unless investors and regulators do more to prevent what Steele terms a climate Lehman Brothers moment, working families, investors, and taxpayers will be left holding the bag. We need equitable solutions for communities of color, agricultural communities, many of which are communities of color too, and all Americans who are similarly geographically impacted. Capital can move across borders in minutes, yet working families are far more bound to the communities in which we all live. We need to lean against the downward pressure that mobile capital can place on worker wages, environmental standards, and more, be it within the country or internationally. Laissez-faire rules, including around the capital markets and financial regulation, get you concentrations of wealth and economic power, and ultimately, deep distrust in the political system that enabled that. Equity is only one of the reasons why I feel so strongly about a focus on financial sector transparency and accountability around the emissions and finances, the labor practices and tax risks it enables, and other ESG issues. Ultimately, it's far more equitable to hold accountable the large financial firms that are financing, underwriting, and trading in climate risk or labor risk in financial products um, and bringing those finance emissions, for example, down in line with the Paris Accord and the best science than it is to smack the community banks and credit unions working, who are serving working families and farmers. Bringing down emissions across the financial system will reduce the climate impacts on those communities and on all of us. Getting to net zero by 2050 is the best way to reduce climate financial risk and protect investors. Similarly, holding the financial sector accountable on worker empowerment, systemic risk, tax fairness and human rights and democracy, powerful signals via the marketplace that we are all in this together, investors and the public. 
The United States has for far too long been a laggard in sustainable finance. Correcting that presents an opportunity for better markets and for American leadership in the world. Today, the subcommittee considers a number of important bills, all of which advance sustainable finance and which I supplement with a range of recommendations. All of these areas interact with one another in multiple ways and progress across them together reinforces the effectiveness of all of them. Our history of predicting past financial, consumer and investor protection crisis is poor, but we have the opportunity to get it right this time. I hope we seize that opportunity. Ultimately, it's about enabling tax it's about enabling capitalism to work. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering your questions. Well, uh, thank you, and thank you for uh, ending uh, uh, more quickly than uh, and not using absolutely all of your time. I now represent uh, Ms. Uh, Tony. Thank you, Chair Sherman, Ranking Member Zinga, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this very timely and important hearing to discuss the necessity to normalize climate change and social responsibility as a consideration of corporate boards and investors. I truly appreciate the opportunity to testify about the very real risks to investors, markets, and communities, particularly black and brown and marginalized areas that are disproportionately impacted when corporations fail to calculate the risk and share it regarding climate change. I'm here today in my capacity as the Climate Justice Liaison for the Environmental Defense Fund and Senior Advisor to Moms Clean Air Force. Together, we're a community of over 3.7 million parents, members, and allies that tackle our planet's biggest environmental challenges through science, partnership, economics, and advocacy. I previously served as administrator for the EPA Southeast region under President Obama, and I'm a former mayor, having served my hometown of Greenville, Mississippi for two terms. I've recently served as a climate justice advisor to two Fortune 500 companies, but my most important job is mom. I'm the mother of three children ages 25, 15, and four. And it's through these lenses that I share my expertise on the impact of climate change as a risk impact to corporations. It's also with great pleasure that I sit alongside colleagues who are no stranger to this work or our organizations. This subject is not new to us, but what's unfortunate is that the warnings we all shared over 10 years ago were not heeded. Right now, today, we're experiencing in real time the devastation, physical and financial loss borne by those most unable to stand the burden due to the failures of corporations to adequately prepare and disclose their climate risk. I'm going to focus on the impacts felt by what I call the invisible investor, and that's the American taxpayers invested in the infrastructure and assets of our communities nationwide. More often than not, the brunt of these expenses fall on communities most at risk to the impacts of climate change. Now, when I was married, I was blessed with a really good corporate partner, Mars Food Incorporated. They've um, operated Uncle Ben's Rice, now known as Ben's Original Rice, in Greenville, Mississippi, for over 40 years. They not only supply needed jobs to the community, but they also hold an important role as a major public asset. They occupy over 80 acres, 250,000 square feet of space, and produce 100,000 tons of rice annually. It's the largest Mars food factory in the world. Sitting right on the Mississippi River, it serves as an anchor to a majority African-American community that's worked hard to overcome systemic poverty for generations. Now, during my time of public service, I had to manage not one, but two 500-year flood events. Both events caused extensive and expensive damage to the infrastructure of the community, roads, bridges, and water systems. They were all impacted by the heavy rainfall and the incessant storms that battered the city year after year. Quite frankly, the tax base of the city couldn't handle the existing infrastructure needs, let alone the added pressure of becoming resilient to climate impacts. It's the type of activity that will cause a major business or corporation to close up shop and move somewhere else. Nevertheless, Mars Food Climate Sustainability Plan took into account the asset placement, needs preparation, and mitigation necessary to continue strong global economic growth while supporting local community needs. Their willingness to not only assess climate risk, but also share the information meant that I was prepared to account for the necessary support. Street upgrades, police and fire in case of emergency, water system points of weakness, potential levee breaches, and places to point the Army Corps of Engineers for review. All of these calculated costs added value to the company while protecting the invisible investor, the citizens of my city, who through their tax dollars were able to defer and reinvest repairs to other places that was needed.
How I wish that same energy could have emerged in Texas with the recent winter storms and energy debacle that arose from the complete failure of publicly traded energy corporations to prepare, let alone disclose their climate risks. While you're certainly here that voluntary climate risk disclosures create a better opportunity for corporations to self-regulate while protecting their proprietary information, the bottom line is that the astronomical rates in the deregulated system represent a failure of market incentives. It also demonstrates that some oversight is necessary to protect those most at risk from the economic fallout of these intense climate weather events. These are the invisible investors because the people pay a high price when there's a market crash. They can't short sell their stock in the community. They're not able to redistribute the loss among other assets. The invisible investors are not gonna be able to categorize the outrageously high electric and water bills as a capital loss or reduce their tax rate. How our government corporations and communities respond right now will determine whether or not we learn from our historic history of systemic racism and exclusion by following the science and listening to community experts in order to create a more efficient and equitable process that saves our economy, our ecosystem, and lives at the same time. I stand ready to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. We uh, will now go to uh, Ms. Ramani. Thank you. Chair Chairman, Ranking Member Hozinga, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Veena Ramani, and I represent Ceres, a nonprofit organization that works with hundreds of influential investors and companies to tackle the world's greatest sustainability challenges, including the climate crisis. My testimony draws from Ceres' long history in working on climate change risk management and climate change disclosure. Climate change is not only an environmental issue, it is a systemic financial risk. The physical impacts of climate change are happening all around us, just this past year, we've lived through the worst wildfire season, the busiest hurricane season, and the hottest year on record. Combined damages from these and other extreme weather events totaled close to $100 billion in 2020. These impacts are landing disproportionately on low-income communities, rural communities, and communities of color. As my fellow panelists have reiterated, climate change, public health, and racial inequality it don't exist in silos. They are deeply intertwined and in turn affect financial market stability and broader economic well-being. Companies are adjusting at different speeds to this new normal. Many companies are seeing and embracing the lucrative opportunities being created by the shift to a net zero economy. We've seen companies set goals, innovate, uh, and evolve their business strategies. I don't know what the deal is. Actions but... like this remain the exception rather than the rule. In fact, last year, when Ceres assessed the climate risks of major banks, we found, they mo found that more than half of their syndicated loans face significant transition risks because many of their clients are not prepared for the shift to a net zero economy. Investors have known about these physical and transition risks for years. Most investors understand that climate is not just a financial risk, it is a material risk. But the latest understanding from the Federal Reserve and other regulators is that the climate crisis is a systemic risk that threatens the very stability of financial markets. In the face of the climate crisis, companies, investors, and regulators need to make consequential decisions, and they need to make them now. The foundation for this is starting to be laid. Companies are starting to integrate climate change into their risk management. Investors are including climate change in shareholder proposals, their dialogue with companies, and their investment analysis. Financial regulators have started to include climate change factors into their supervision of key industries. But there's a catch. Companies, investors, and regulators don't have access to quality, actionable, and reliable climate change disclosures at scale. You cannot make good decisions without good information. To address climate change risks in financial markets, decision makers first need information on the nature of the risks that markets face. And for this, companies need to provide information on their climate change performance, strategies, and approach. It's important to note that there has been an uptick in voluntary climate change disclosures driven by investor demand and the pioneering work done by key groups in the space like GRI, SASB, CDP, and others. But even though the volume of disclosure has grown, the quality of disclosures remains variable. Investors and regulators are still not getting decision-useful insights. 
Federal Reserve Governor Lil Brainard aptly summarized the core of the problem just last week. She said, and I quote, current voluntary disclosure practices are an important first step, but they are prone to variable quality, incompleteness, and a lack of actionable data, unquote. The SEC has issued guidance that explains how its existing disclosure rules could be applied to climate risks, but to date, the guidance has not been strongly enforced. For clear-eyed and urgent action to address the climate crisis, robust climate change disclosure is key. Decisive action is needed by the SEC because this is fundamental to the success of companies, investors, and regulators. Ceres has called on the SEC to robustly enforce the existing interpretive guidance on climate change. And just yesterday, Acting Chair Alison Lee of the SEC issued a statement directing SEC staff to enhance their focus on climate-related disclosure. We welcome this as a critically important step in the right direction. We also call on the SEC to build on this new focus and adopt and enforce rules for climate change disclosure. In closing, companies, investors, and regulators lack vital information on climate change, and in a very real way, they're flying blind. Again, you cannot make good decisions without good information. And given the scale of the risk and the important decisions that need to be made, climate change information doesn't just need to be good, it needs to be as good as possible. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for adhering to our time limits and we'll go on to Mr. Andrew. Chairman Sherman, Ranking Member Heisinga, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. My name is James Anderson. I'm an investment manager for the Board Governance and Sustainability Program for the California Public Employees Retirement System. I'm pleased to appear before you today on behalf of CalPERS. We applaud and support the subcommittee's focus on building a sustainable and competitive economy. I will provide an overview of CalPERS, discuss our governing principles, and discuss climate risk, charitable political expenditures, human capital management, and board diversity. CalPERS is the largest defined benefit public pension fund in the United States with approximately $450 billion in global assets. Ultimately, CalPERS' primary responsibility is to our beneficiaries. Since December 2019, we have considered climate-related risks to be among the top three risks to the long-term value of our portfolio. Our view aligns with the U.S. National Climate Assessment's finding that climate change exacerbates existing vulnerabilities in communities across the United States, presenting gro growing challenges to human health and safety, quality of life, and the rate of economic growth. Climate change is a systemic risk, so it is critical that investors can access clear disclosures of risks it poses to long-term value creation by the companies in which they invest. Accordingly, we help lead global initiatives like Climate Action 100 Plus, an initiative which CalPERS co-founded to engage the systemically important carbon emitters to mitigate climate risk in our global equity portfolio. However, initiatives like Climate Action 100 Plus are poor substitutes for policy and regulatory action. In positive international developments, the International Accounting Standards Board has issued guidance that promotes including certain climate risk items in financial statements. This is an important development and one U.S. policymakers should consider thoughtfully. Our principles call for robust board oversight and disclosure of corporate charitable and political activity to ensure alignment with business strategy and to protect assets on behalf of shareholders. The materiality of corporate political spending was recently reaffirmed by companies themselves in the aftermath of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol building. I want to highlight Justice Kennedy's words from Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission because they make clear that the Supreme Court envisioned wide disclosure of political contributions. Justice Kennedy wrote, with the advent of the internet, prompt disclosure of expenditures can provide shareholders and citizens with the information needed to hold corporations and elected officials accountable for their positions and supporters. This transparency enables the electorate to make informed decisions and give proper weight to different speakers and messages. Justice Kennedy's expectation has not been fulfilled, but is more apparent now than ever before that it should be. The convergence of the current economic climate and public health crises, as well as the mounting call to advance racial equity have accelerated investors' focus on effectively managing human capital. The value of human capital management disclosures is straightforward. Businesses depend on the workforce as a source of value creation, which if mismanaged 
could harm long-term performance. Researchers have found that high quality human capital management practices correlate with lower employee turnover, higher productivity, and better corporate financial performance, producing a considerable and sustained alpha over time. There remains a substantial lack of board diversity at U.S. companies. NASDAQ has stated that the U.S. currently ranks 53rd in board gender diversity, according to the World Economic Forum. Third party analysis shows that as many as 70 percent of NASDAQ companies boards lack a woman or racially diverse person. The Office of the Illinois State Treasurer published a white paper entitled The Investment Case for Board Diversity, which provides an extensive and comprehensive review of academic and practitioner research on the value of gender and racial ethnic board diversity for investors. The examination finds that the gender and racial ethnic composition of corporate boards does indeed have a material and relevant impact on company performance. Requiring standardized disclosures of relevant information is necessary to close the information gap. In line with this view, we strongly support a further comprehensive review of the disclosure requirements of Regulation SX and Regulation SK with a greater focus on investor needs. We look forward to working with the subcommittee and the committee to discuss these issues, as well as the policy proposals set forth in today's hearings and more proposals in the future. Thank you, Chairman Sherman and Ranking Member Heizinga for inviting me to participate in this hearing, and I look forward to your questions. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Vivek. Great. Thank you, Chairman, Ranking Member, and Committee Members. My name is Vivek Ramaswamy. I offer strictly my personal viewpoints and not those of any organization that I'm affiliated with. I was born and raised in Ohio. I spent seven years as a biotech investor. For three of those years, I also attended law school. In 2014, I founded a biotech company that I led as CEO until last month. And I'm now writing a book about stakeholder capitalism, a topic that's central to today's discussion. I, I do notice a sound, if I could take a pause in the uh, hearing. Are you able to hear that sound? Okay, you're all able to hear me, that's fine. It sounds good. So. Uh, so stakeholder capitalism refers to the idea that companies should serve not only their shareholders, but also other societal interests. And big tech, big banks, and big business have roundly endorsed the idea. Milton Friedman didn't like it because it might lead companies to be less profitable. But my concerns are different. I worry that stakeholder capitalism represents a threat to the integrity of American democracy itself. For companies to pursue societal interests in addition to shareholder interests, companies and their investors have to first define what those other societal interests ought to be. And that isn't a business judgment, it's a moral judgment. Speaking as an American, I do not want our capitalist elites to play a larger role than they already do in determining our society's core values. The answers to those questions ought to be answered by America's citizens through our democratic process, publicly through open debate and privately at the ballot box. Personally, I don't know if that's a Republican idea or a Democratic idea, I consider it an American idea. It is puzzling to me that stakeholder capitalism though is viewed as a liberal idea. Many progressives who love stakeholder capitalism abhor Citizens United precisely because it permits corporations to influence our elections and our democracy. Stakeholder capitalism is Citizens United on steroids. It demands that CEOs use corporate resources to implement the social goals that they want to push. In the pharmaceutical industry, does rejecting stakeholder capitalism mean putting profits ahead of patients? No, but putting patients first means actually putting patients first, including ahead of other social causes. It means we don't care about the race or gender of the scientist who discovers a cure to COVID-19 or whether the manufacturing and distribution process that delivers a vaccine most quickly to patients is carbon neutral. Conflicts of interest actually lie at the heart of this debate. In the real world, most conflicts aren't actually financial. If I'm a public company CEO and I decide to use the corporate piggy bank to make a donation to my high school or to the temple where I worship, that should raise a red flag since my high school or my temple have nothing to do with my business. But why is it any different if a CEO uses the corporate piggy bank to make a donation to a climate change organization or to a specific racial advocacy group? Many CEOs did exactly that last year and they were applauded for it. But in both cases, the CEO derives a personal benefit from using the company's piggy bank to make a donation. That's a conflict of interest. And I find it curious that there's no mandated disclosures about that. Many CEOs are surely going to advise you to mandate these ESG related disclosures. My humble advice to you is this. Ask yourself what these business leaders hope to achieve for themselves in that process. Some of them may hope to distract you from other regulatory issues that pose real risks to their business. For example, in Silicon Valley, disclosing climate risks is easy. Respecting user privacy, now that's hard. When choosing between constraints on matters that relate to the core of your business versus matters that don't, self-interested CEOs are generally gonna choose the latter. I also have other concerns that I'd be glad to address in the Q&A. I think mandatory disclosures 
tend to impose burdens on companies. They tend to favor incumbents over startups. They make it harder for startup companies to go public. I also think that these policies might contribute to an ESG-linked asset bubble, akin to the pre-2008 housing bubble that was driven by government policy to spur home ownership. But those are secondary issues. The bigger issue is the threat to American democracy itself. If we're honest, let's acknowledge that the debate today isn't actually about protecting investors. It's about fighting climate change. And I'm not saying that's a bad goal, but I do think that's what's going on here. And if that's true, then I urge each of you to just be frank and to just say that. Protecting investors isn't the main reason, it is a justification. If the goal were to protect investors, there are many, many other disclosures you would mandate ahead of climate risks on a wide range of topics. For example, about the health and dietary practices of company employees or the social or political commitments of the company's CEO. If we pretend like protecting investors is the real reason for these climate disclosures, we risk opening that Pandora's box. So in closing, speaking to you as an American, I urge you as members of Congress to implement your chosen policies through the front door rather than sneaking them in through the back door. Do not use companies as instruments to accomplish what you cannot get done directly as legislators. Unlike you, CEOs are not democratically accountable, and that might make them a convenient solution in the short run, but in the long run, you will create a monster that you cannot put back in its cage. And that's not just bad for Republicans or for Democrats, it's bad for America. Speaking as an American, I don't wanna live in a corporatocracy. I don't wanna live in a one dollar, one vote system. I don't wanna live in a modern version of old world Europe where a small group of elites decide what's good for society and the rest of the world. I wanna live in a democracy where everyone's voice and vote counts equally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I recognize uh, myself uh, for five minutes of uh, questioning. Um, and as to the uh, witness who, who just spoke, I would say that we are walking through the front door here. The SEC is part of a government, the democratically elected government, and we're using a democratically elected government to try to achieve um, at least some corporate recognition of important social impacts. Um, I do want to, uh, to commend the SEC for just yesterday. Acting SEC Chair Allison Lee announced uh, that she's directed the Division of Corporate Finance to enhance its focus on climate-related disclosures in public uh, company filings. I think that's relevant even to your earnings per share investors who will want to know what risk factor the uh, company has from climate change, but also whether it is in a position to attract investment and attract clients and enhance its reputation because it's doing something uh, helpful uh, for the environment. The uh, ranking uh, member uh, uh, said that ESG funds don't necessarily outperform. I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of information on our, uh, uh, in our financial statements where you could say companies that spend more on advertising don't overperform, don't underperform. But we disclose a lot of information to shareholders who may decide that in the future such companies such as companies with diverse boards uh, uh, will overperform in the future, whether they've overperformed in the past uh, or not. Uh, my first question uh, is again on uh, board diversity. Mr. Andrews, uh, NASDAQ recently issued a proposal to require all the companies to make uh, certain disclosures requiring the diversity of their boards. Uh, we are considering, and I see uh, 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 him uh, here, I guess uh, foreign affairs has adjourned for a bit. The Congressman Meeks, uh, Improving Corporate Governance Through Diversity Act, which the House passed last year and which would uh, put in place similar requirements for all public companies. Can you tell us as an institutional investor what a diverse board um, signals to you about a company and uh, how it might factor into your investment decision? A diverse board signals that um, the company has considered the talents of the entire population in selecting board candidates. This is not happen happening currently. More than half of US-based public companies have all white boards. We are 53rd in terms of gender diversity. That means 52 countries have more women on their boards than, U than US companies. And this is the baseline in which we're in which we're working for, working from. And so in order to basically consider the talents of the entire population, we need to make certain that boards do this and place diverse people on their boards. 
Thank you uh, for that answer. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Romani, in uh, uh, 2019, the European Commission issued uh, guidance providing a framework for corporate related uh, uh, for corporate climate related disclosures. Last year, the UK announced that it will be uh, putting in uh, uh, place some mandatory climate disclosure risks for the London Stock Exchange. And last fall, uh, New Zealand announced they'll implement uh, requirements uh, uh, based on the recommendations of a task force on climate related financial disclosures uh, put forward by a group convened by uh, the G20. Uh, do any of these, the, the, the EU, New Zealand slash G20, uh, I know the UK hasn't uh, fully filled out uh, uh, what their plan is. Do any of them provide a good model for us to use to define and have numerical standards for the issues we're talking about here today? Um, thank you, Chair Sherman. Our recommendation is to um, premise any rules that we create for climate change disclosure on the framework that has been offered by the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure. The reason I suggest this is because the TCFD is a framework that was created largely by the financial community to essentially generate information that they could use in understanding the risk, the financial risk of climate change in terms of their own portfolios and in terms of the capital markets within which they function. That's one of the reasons that we do support the Climate Risk Disclosure Act, because it is premised on the TCFD and because it has a very appropriate focus on generating thank, disclosure. Thank you. I, 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 I just want to add one thing, and that's how important it is that companies disclose how much they're paying to third world governments for petroleum and other mineral extraction. The risk that the, that the money is stolen and that the people of the country don't even know how much is coming in is a terrible risk for that country. It's also a reputational risk uh, for the petroleum company as well. Now let's uh, move on to Mr. Heisinga, who's recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I'm gonna briefly note that uh, Chair uh, Yellen, soon to be Secretary of Treasury Yellen, said in 2017 at the Jackson Hole uh, Conference that uh, that 1503 section that you're talking about was the worst part of the Dodd-Frank Act uh, flat out. So uh, just, uh, just to set the context there. Um, Mr. Ramaswamy, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations here on this committee about IPOs and about investor ability to go in and be a part of the, uh, the financial system. And I'm curious from your perspective as someone who's worked in the private sector uh, extensively in both with private and public companies. Is this going to promote private companies to go public and offer up that opportunity for citizens to engage in the public uh, sphere of finance? Look, as you're aware, uh, in recent years, there has been a, <clears throat> excuse me for just one second. There's been a trend of fewer companies going public and choosing to remain private. There's a lot of factors driving that trend, but all else equal, added disclosure requirements are a reason why many companies choose not to go public. In my opinion, would one additional risk factor relating to climate risks single-handedly be a deterrent for companies to go public? I don't personally think that would be the single-handed straw that breaks the camel's back. However, I do think that that opens the Pandora's box, that opens the door to, if we're really being intellectually honest and limiting ourselves to identifying factors, risk factors that protect investors, there is a much longer list of factors that are more material to investors than the individual climate risks of a particular climate related risks of a particular corporation that if incorporated into the added disclosure regime would collectively prevent companies from being able to successfully go public. Over the years, the piling mounting uh, part of uh, the regulatory side has uh, has uh, has stopped that you used a, uh, a term uh, corporatocracy. I was going to call it a mercantilist government. Um, I, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll lay out my nerd card here and and uh, and reference Star Wars and when Queen Amidala was talking in the Senate and she was addressing the Trade Federation, the Corporate Alliance, the Intergalactic Banking Clan, the Commerce Guild, the Techno Union. I mean, that's 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 the direction in which it seems like we could be going here uh, as we have executives and and companies playing a fundamental role in determining society's core values and policies rather than government. 
uh, doing that? And I'm curious if you could expand on your experiences uh, that shape your concern with this. Yeah, so, so based on my firsthand experiences, I believe that corporations accrete greater power when they're responsible, not just for determining the rules of the road in the marketplace for products and services, where to build a manufacturing plant or where to build a research facility, but also whether to prioritize climate change over prices for consumer goods or to prioritize one conception of diversity over another, corporations then actually have not only a lease on the things that we buy in the marketplace for goods and services, but the ideas that we consume in the marketplace of ideas. And today's companies, especially in Silicon Valley, but on Wall Street and Silicon Valley included, are some of the most powerful companies in the history of the world. Even the Dutch East India Company, which had a private militia of its own and a private currency, still didn't have the ability to influence what we thought, what we prioritized in terms of our moral values, or what we could read, or what we could discuss in open forums like this one. That's what today's technology companies and, and corporations across America control today. So we ought to be really concerned about giving them even greater power. And I'm going to close this answer with, with a brief reference to something that many of you may be familiar with, which is there's a body of law relating to Congress delegating its responsibilities to administrative agencies. And the Administrative Procedures Act, as many of you know, governed that body of law. But at least that puts guardrails around what the alphabet soup of the FEC, FDA, SEC, FTC, and so on are able to administer. The Administrative Procedure Act says they have to at least go through certain procedures before implementing certain rules as law. When we do this with corporations, using disclosures regimes or other tools to get corporations to implement social values that ought to be adjudicated through our democracy, there are no such constitutional guardrails. And the new alphabet soup of AAPL, AMZN, MSFT, or GOOG is not constrained by the same constitutional constraints as even the administrative agencies that you delegate your responsibilities to through the APA. Well, uh, I've, I've been concerned about uh, government, elected government at all levels. Uh, seemingly having this uh, wish to give up not their constitutional responsibilities, their constitutional duties uh, to, uh, to bureaucracies and others who then get to make tough decisions in a vacuum rather than being held directly accountable for those, uh, for those difficult decisions. And so uh, as we're closing out our time, I, I appreciate your, your view on this. And I, I hope that we're going to be able to, uh, to make sure that we're creating an atmosphere that allows more of these private companies Thank you. I want to thank the ranking member for pointing out that Dodd-Frank was such an excellent piece of legislation and even its worst provision was a good provision. And uh, I will now uh, recognize Mr. Foster for five minutes. Um, thank you. And am I audible and visible here? Hello? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Green, uh, following the Supreme Court Citizens United decision, uh, publicly traded companies, often with deep pockets, can and do engage in significant political funding. Uh, these companies are not required to disclose the funding of their of the political activities, even to their own shareholders. Uh, this means that shareholders have no way of knowing whether the companies they are investing in are engaged in political spending or what kind of spending those companies are in, engaged in or the purposes. Uh, for example, shareholders and CEOs are, are unlikely to be in the same tax bracket. So <laughs> investors... Are you, what? Excuse me. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, I will, I will proceed. Um, you know, for example, shareholders and CEOs are unlikely to be in the same tax bracket. So shareholders might be very interested to discover if the investments that they've made are being used by those running the company to influence politicians to shift taxes in a way that increase taxes for shareholders while dropping it for CEOs. But that they have no way of knowing that. And now more than ever, investors are also exercising their political voice with their money as our customers and consumers. And investigator, investors are more are sophisticated than ever and are concerned more with more than just a company's bottom line and their balance sheet. And they understand the reputational risk of having questionable political contributions made by a company that they've considered investing in. Um, so Mr. Andrews and Mr. Green, uh, what, is, what sort of serious problems come up when investors are unaware that companies that they hold equity in are funding significant political activities. We can start with Mr. Andrus, if that. Um. There are a number of issues. There are a number of issues that come up. 
First, all we're asking for is transparency and the information. We're not questioning whether or not the expenditure should be made, but if made, it should be disclosed so that we would have the information so that we can make proper investment decisions. It's important to point out that investment decisions include voting decisions, such as voting on, voting on boards and voting on executive compensation. So we need that particular information. Some of the things that can happen are what we saw on January 6th. And when you unpack it, the, con the concern is substantial. It's critical that some of those investments could lead to insurrection within our own government. I know some people downplay that, but that's a ser serious concern that money, i.e. shareholders' money, is being used in that particular capacity. At a minimum, it should be disclosed if companies choose to make those sorts of contributions. All right, um, Mr. Green. Thank you. Um, I, I would uh, very much add that right now the challenge is, uh, and this goes to the point by the, the, the witness uh, a couple minutes ago, that these determinations are right now being made by companies, by uh, elite insiders, by corporate uh, CEOs and a small number of other corporate elites. Uh, and there are real questions about how investors' money is being utilized. And so if you don't have the transparency, you don't know whether a company's positions around um, any number of issues, whether it's climate change or um, uh, uh, worker treatment or um, any number of issues are being matched by what uh, is going on and what types of positions they are taking uh, in Washington. If, if this money was not important, uh, why are companies spending any money engaging in the political process at all? It's not, it's not charity. Uh, it's, it goes to the deep interest of companies. And investors are the ones who ultimately uh, are the ones whose money's at risk, and they need to understand that. Well, thank you. And, and you know, the, one of the biggest issues that I see personally is the potential misalignment of interests between uh, those running the companies as individuals and those of the shareholders, uh, that without that transparency, there is no guarantee uh, that those interests will be even approximately aligned when it comes time to invest in to try to affect our political system. Well, my time has just about expired and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Stivers is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Uh... And I appreciate all the witnesses uh, for their testimony. Mr. Ramaswamy, um, in the chairman's own words, he said at the beginning of this hearing in his statement that shareholders want this information. Uh, in your experience, don't shareholders already have the ability to get this information? Yeah, so, so you, raise, you raise an important point, Congressman Stivers. It is that the distinction between a worthy disclosure and a mandatory disclosure. Just because a disclosure may be worthy to particular investors does not alone mean that it ought to be a mandatory disclosure because investors elect their corporate boards every year. A majority of investors actually in most cases, in most states can actually amend the corporate bylaws to demand whatever disclosures it is that they want. That's not to say that there's no space for mandatory disclosures, but it is only to say that just because a given disclosure may even be worthy does not automatically mean that it has to be a mandatory disclosure because investors in particular companies are able to wield their own power as shareholders to demand disclosures in a particular case. So first, the question is, is the disclosure worthy or not material for investors? And second of all, even if it is material, are investors able to get that information on their own? There's then the separate question of whether a particular class of disclosures is required to be mandatory and what effect that ought to have and ought not to have on decisions of you all or the SEC to mandate those disclosures. On that last question, I think that a lot of this, that one of the one of the arguments that I find at least intellectually per persuasive, is that there may be negative externalities of certain companies' behaviors that ought to be internalized into their own decision making, and that the investors who own those companies may want to know how they can internalize those negative externalities as well. And, and one point I'd just like to inject into this, and somebody raised January sixth earlier, I, I think it's I think it's an important point that the negative externalities for American democracy of a small group of institutional elites adjudicated through the corporate boardroom, mandating and, and in concert with, with the work of the SEC mandating particular disclosures is monolithically enforcing a particular agenda that many Americans may not agree with, but not only do they not agree with, may not have an opportunity to have their voice heard equally. And we convert from the system of one person, one vote, 
instead into a system of one dollar one vote and and i'll tell you a, a if, if i may congressman stivers to, to, to sort of Please. share a short story to demonstrate the principle of, of what i mean before when when i used to go to temples as a kid when my parents used to take me to india there used to be a system where every pilgrim had to wait in line patiently to wait their turn to get to the front of the temple but today when you go to those temples when you travel to those temples you can actually pay a little bit of extra money and get to the front of the line and some of the people can pay a lot of money and get to the very front of the line and to me that's not the way that a religious institution is, is necessarily supposed to work at its best i feel the same way about our democracy in that with a small group of, of institutional elites in the corporate boardrooms adjudicated through mandated SET disclosures on top of that to be goaded into doing more of this, are able to convert our system, our democracy, into a $1 one vote system instead of a one person one vote system, which tells the people who show up at the ballot box every November that their vote doesn't matter as much as the vote of somebody in a corporate boardroom because of the number of dollars that they control in the marketplace. And, and to me, the use of that market power to translate into social currency on matters that aren't corporate matters, but aren't, aren't commercial matters, but are matters relating to moral values, normative questions like how we ought to address climate change or what conception of racial justice matters over a different one or how we tackle issues of racial equity. Those are questions that ought to be adjudicated through open public debate in spheres like this one, not necessarily through the corporate boardroom. And while, while, the, while the chairman made a good point in the very beginning, I do think that this is a further direction in goading companies to be able to take on even further responsibility and mission creep in a way that has a negative externality for the integrity of American democracy itself. And if the discussion is going to center on negative externalities for the environment or negative externalities for other social principles that we care about, I think that at least in that cost benefit analysis of whether to mandate a disclosure, we ought also take into account the possibility of a negative externality for American democracy, including Americans who may feel disaffected by decisions made Thank by corporations you. privately in the board. Thank you. Uh, now tell me, you know, uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, our republic, our constitutional republic, is intentionally messy with checks and balances for the very reasons you talked about. Could you talk about some of the problems that would be created by the fact that corporate elites could influence and implement a, an agenda uh, without checks and balances? I'll show, show, show a very short, funny story. I'll have, I was having dinner with the CEO of a big bank about a year and a half ago, I won't say which one, uh, out of respect to him, he was asked at the dinner if he wanted to be president of the United States. And his answer, without missing a beat, was that, of course, he wants to be president. He just doesn't want to run for president. And everyone in the room laughed, not because they, what he said was so ridiculous, but because what he said was so obviously true. And I think a lot of the messiness of our dem democratic process is part of what makes it beautiful. We shouldn't sidestep it to get to our solutions via the simpler corporate route instead. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good to be with you. Very important hearing. Uh, my question goes to Mr. Andrus. Um, several Republican senators recently sent a letter criticizing uh, NASDAQ's decision to require its listed companies to disclose the demographic composition of their boards as they relate to race and gender. The letter specifically stated such requirements were narrow and misses the mark. However, that letter failed to examine why the SEC's current disclosure rules, which leaves diversity to be defined by companies, is led to vague and less useful disclosure. So my question is, why are the SEC's current diversity disclosure requirements inadequate, in your opinion, if they are? So we have to, we have to discuss exactly what they are. So basically, all the board has to do is basically say that they consider diversity or if they have a diversity policy, they don't have to take any real steps to diversity. And so they are inadequate because they've done absolutely nothing to change where we are. The baseline where we are, more than half of US publicly traded companies have all white boards. Roughly 16% of those companies have no women on the board. So when we are in that particular baseline, and it's, there's been a lot of talk about um, corporate elites or something like that, those same corporate elites that are being said to be um, in favor of ESG or whatnot are the ones who basically put, placed us in this particular situation. We need real policy um, work to actually address the crisis that we're in and to actually create some board diversity. 
It has worked in other countries that have had gender related policies that have been able to add women to the board. The California initiative has been very successful in adding women to the board and will be successful in adding racially diverse and LGBTQ people to the board. And so we need a federal response that will actually kickstart what should have happened over a decade ago when the issue was being uh, when the issue was being addressed by the SEC. So we know now that that response was totally inadequate. We need a more adequate response. Well, thank you. And also, let me ask you this question. My bill, the uh, Improving Corporate Governance Through Diversity Act, of course, it requires a more specific disclosures around board demographics, but it also, the bill also requires disclosures around the demographics of companies, senior management. So my question to you uh, is, is the C-suite diversity as important as board level diversity? In some cases, the C-suite diversity is even more important than board level diversity. We focused on board diversity because that's where shareholders interact with the corporation. We have the right to vote on the boards and we monitor what the board activity happens to be. And so that has been what, what we have focused on. So it is very welcome that your bill also focuses on executive diversity, which is an area that um, we need substantial amount of work on. And then when we're thinking long term, it means that those companies will consider the talents of all of the people within the country, add all of the talents of the people within the country. And in the following years, we could expect to see more diversity within the C-suite, which will actually lead to even more board diversity, which is which is needed. Thank you. Let me try to squeeze this in quick to uh, Miss uh, Romana. Um, you know, I'm proud that the, the Biden administration has re-entered the, the, the Paris Climate, Climate Agreement. But let me ask this question right quick. Institutional Shareholder Services, or ISS, which is a firm well known in the industry in advising its investors on vote recommendations for board elections and various corporate matters, has set out to analyze what corporations are doing to reduce emissions. But even still, an overwhelming 215 companies in the S&P 500 index have no target at all. Uh, why is it so crucial for these companies to set targets and what can these companies do to not only ensure that their pledges, uh, their, their pledges relate to their lending and financial activities, but also to their stocks and bonds that they manage? Thank you for the question, Congressman. We at Ceres believe that companies should set goals and adjust and evolve their business strategies for climate change to meet the financial risk of climate change. So we very much appreciate the fact that we've re-entered the Paris Climate Agreement and are looking for companies to set goals that are aligned with the science of climate change because those goals would then meet the risks that climate change poses to, to them, to their investors and to financial markets at large. Thank you. I think my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. A uh, little change in plans. We won't find it necessary to adjourn the hearing for votes because uh, Mr. Kasten will be able uh, to sit in uh, and he'll take over uh, maybe 30 minutes after the they initially call uh, the first vote. And uh, hopefully he'll be able to stay with us uh, and uh, be our substitute chair for uh, for 30 minutes thereafter. Uh, with that, I recognize uh, Ms. Uh, Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, banks and other financial firms are proactively making significant investments in renewable energy, and they're doing it without the heavy hand of regulation or political pressure. Uh, that's because the free market is responding to increased interest, I think, in green energy in particular. Just this morning, Wells Fargo announced it recently surpassed $10 billion in, um, in tax equity investments in the wind, solar, and fuel cells industries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit this press release for the record. Assume that's in order. In addition, Wells Fargo committed to providing $200 billion in financing to sustainable businesses and projects by 2030. I'll be admitted without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
But it's not just one firm making these substantial investments. Many of America's largest financial institutions have made multi-billion dollar sustainable finance commitments without government mandates. Instead of pushing forward uh, prescriptive proposals on small businesses and adding additional barriers to capital formation, this committee needs to, I think, prioritize regulatory reforms that will lift up our economy and get Americans back to work. Mr. Ramaswamy, uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, does the fact that many institutions are investing in and financing green energy projects negate the need for enhanced regulation and disclosure on ESG issues? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman, and, and I believe that it does. I obviously think that the market working in a particular direction sends us signals as to where additional regulation is and isn't needed. But I'd actually like to take that one step further to highlight a separate concern that I have, even in the direction of the private market already. And I think the private market is in part not operating as a truly free market, but actually in response to regulations and to regulatory incentives which already exist, which have distorted the private market already in the direction of potentially creating the early stages of an ESG linked asset bubble. And, and in order to understand why, I think there's certain factors relating to the 2008 financial crisis that we have to take into account. I think it's instructive. Now I'm offering this not as a history lesson, but potentially as the early signs of a warning. The standard explanation for the subprime mortgage bubble before 2008 was that predatory lenders were greasy, greedy sharks who took advantage of the opportunity to ultimately uh, you know, make loans that they shouldn't have made. But in reality, the question is where those predatory sharks got all of that money in the first place. And of course, all of you know, perhaps better than I, that the roots of this began with government policy to spur home ownership, including through the yes, birth thank of quasi-government. Thank you, quasi thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. I, I appreciate the history lesson here, but I've got more questions. What yeah. would be the, the impact on small businesses, such as those back in Missouri's 2nd Congressional District um, and Main Street investors with 401ks saving for retirement if we allow stakeholder capitalism and ESG disclosures to drive our markets, I think, to your point. Yeah, look, I think that a big part of the trend here is that mom and pop investors have in part benefited from fee-free investment vehicles through passive index funds over the course of the last 10 years. And, and many of the drivers of this new ESG movement, I, I, you would know better than I, but even many of the firms who may advocate for ESG-related disclosures are actually in the traditional active management industry, in the mutual fund industry, which actually charge higher fees to mom and pop investors. Now, I think that part of what may be going on here is that making up for the absence of superior returns compared to passive index funds, we are now seeing the, the masquerade of morality as justifying those higher fees in the first place. Mom and pop investors, including older Americans, are actually, I'm not, are actually tend to be extremely generous, but they would rather be generous. I serve on the board of the Philanthropy Roundtable, which actually records this information, and says that elder Americans are among the most philanthropic, but they would tend to pick the causes they want to donate to on their own rather than handing it over to a mutual fund manager that ultimately yes. picks companies that embody absolutely. their own causes. You're absolutely correct. And, and would you say that these burdensome regulations have a more significant impact on younger companies compared to, let's say, larger companies? They, they do. I think that larger companies tend to be able to bear additional disclosure requirements and additional regulatory requirements, which actually tends to favor incumbents over startup companies. And, and certainly as an entrepreneur, and based on your experience as an entrepreneur and executive, do you think your companies would have been more or less likely to accomplish their goals in terms of producing marketable products if they were required to make ESG disclosures? So, so putting my companies to one side, I think that in general, all else equal, I think startup companies tend to be poor, more poorly bearing of regulatory requirements and disclosure requirements than large companies. They actually counterintuitively help large companies as a consequence. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I will announce. Oh, I see uh, Ms. Axney has got back into her chair just in time. Uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Kasten to uh, be a temporary chair for the next uh, four minutes, and I'm going to recognize Ms. Axney for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had to get my uh, uh, computer plugged in. Uh, thank you so much for having us and for the witnesses for being here today. This hearing, of course, is all about sustainable corporate practices. Uh, which can generate long-term growth both for the economy and for the company. And I want to focus on just one piece of this, which is tax avoidance and my bill to require public country-by-country country reporting. Uh, I sure don't believe that anyone thinks that shifting profits to tax havens like the $60 billion of profits booked in the Cayman Islands every year or outsourcing all of the work to a country with weak labor standards 
and laying off American workers or how a company wants to perform long term. Unfortunately, right now, though, investors don't know if companies are using gimmicks like that or where multinational corporations are really generating their profits. So, Mr. Andrus, it's good to see you again. You testified here last Congress regarding U.S. current uh, tax disclosures that the lack of transparency creates an information gap whereby management may be well aware of risks being taken while share owners are left in the dark. If you had a public country by country disclosures of financial information like tax payments, revenues, employees in a country, would CalPERS and other institutional investors likely consider that information when making decisions about capital allocation? Yes, we would consider that information. And I think you placed it in the right perspective because it's not only returns, it's risk and returns. And we've seen we've seen abuses that could cause um, substantial problems for corporations in which we invest. I think tax by tax, uh, I mean, country by country reporting would alleviate, would alleviate that. And it's information that's well available to the management of the company and easily disclosed. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I know investors representing at least $2 trillion in assets under management have now backed country by country financial disclosures as a critical path to counter that risk. Um, and former SEC Chairman Jay Clayton in testimony before this committee also recognized public country by country disclosures as an increasing part of how sophisticated investors are looking at companies. So as you can tell, support for these disclosures now extends well beyond the usual corners of sustainable investments, includes mainstream uh, investors, credit rating agencies, financial analysts, small businesses, et cetera. And already the Global Reporting Initiative, an ESG standard setter, followed uh, that more than 78% of companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average has brought its new tax standard on public country by country reporting online this year, which is great meaning we can expect voluntary disclosures by corporations as soon as January 2022. But Mr. Green, I'd like to ask you, can you explain a little of why voluntary disclosures like that won't be enough and to give us the kind of information that investors need? Yeah, we, we've had a regime where voluntary disclosure uh, in these areas uh, has been uh, the slow moving uh, norm, but uh, you know we we have not achieved the wide ranging comparability, uh, reliability, and consistency that investors need uh, for the capital markets to work. Let's remember, capitalism works because lots of different investors, millions and millions of different investors, deploy their money based on the information they have, and when that money is deployed based on the the this information that everybody has, money uh, the the capital markets will yield. Uh, competitive returns for all of us. When you don't have that, when the information is only available to the insiders, to those who are already in control, uh, you're not going to have uh, the efficiency and, and the sustainable long-term outcomes uh, that you need in capitalism. And that's why getting this information out there is so essential. And you need a mandatory standard so that you don't have holes in the market where those who have the inside information are keeping it from everyone else who would otherwise move their money somewhere else. Everyone's at risk. Thank you for that. And, and I'll tell you, that's why we need action at the SEC, either directly or through my bill, the Disclosure of Tax Havens and Offshoring Act, to, to your point, to establish a clear, comparable standard for all public companies. Thank you so much. I hope we can get this done to finally provide our investors with the information they need here and to make sure that we know that businesses are generating real sustainable long term growth. I know that myself and other investors want to be able to support businesses that are keeping money in the American economy. Thank you so much. And I yield back. Thank you. I thank Mr. Kasten for uh, stepping in his chair for four or five minutes. Uh, and it's possible that we will get this hearing done before the close the first vote. Well, which means that may be the only time I call upon Mr. Kasten to uh, uh, step in. At this point, I recognize Mr. Hill, and I'll also point out uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Heisinga that uh, at the end of the hearing, I uh, will give him one minute, and I will take one, and then after him, I will take one minute as a closing one-minute statement. We'll go on to Mr. Uh, Hill. Well, thank you, Chairman and uh, Mr. Hazanga, for arranging uh, this hearing so that we can talk about uh, 
uh, these uh, legislative proposals. I'd like to focus my remarks uh, in the climate uh, disclosure arena, it's something that we've talked about in our uh, committee several times before. Uh, Mr. Green and his very uh, good testimony stated uh, that we, meaning the United States, are not great at predicting, quote, financial crises. He says it's, that we're very poor at those predictions uh, in his testimony. I think that's a, a fair point. And uh, Lyle Brainerd, governor of the Federal Reserve, uh, was quoted uh, saying that uh, they're varying in different approaches to uh, current disclosures and that those could be improved. Uh, I think that's a good point that reminds me of the ancient uh, Chinese proverb, those who have knowledge don't predict, those who predict don't have knowledge. So this is an imperfect uh, science that's frustrated this. Uh, going back to when I was in uh, college, uh, we were talking about the coming ice age in the United States. We studied that in our science courses. And then as I was graduating in the late 70s, we were told that Denmark would be underwater due to uh, changing, changing climate conditions uh, within uh, four decades. So uh, bottom line is those did not take place. So I think predictions in this area are challenging. And Mr. Bloomberg's uh, task force that's been mentioned that Mike Bloomberg runs on behalf of the G20 and fundraises for, he says that climate disclosure should be reliable, verifiable and objective. They should be comparable among organizations and sectors, and they should be timely. And so we can accept that as great wisdom from uh, Mike Bloomberg on how to do climate disclosure. And what I'm arguing is we have a materiality standard. We require all companies to disclose things in their financial statements that meet those timeliness issues and accuracy and reliability issues, and they don't go beyond that because I'm arguing that so much of this is not as predictable as some of my friends uh, would suggest. And uh, I think that uh, one example that's always given is uh, the hurricane data and that we should be disclosing at banks a risk to greater hurricanes, but looking at NOAA's numbers since 1853, they're not more and they're not more intense. Uh, in terms of, of making landfall in the United States. In fact, the worst one ever was in 1935, uh, hitting Miami. Uh, but what is different, and I think it is relevant, and I think banks do disclose it, is the issue, if you look at uh, the American Meteorological Society, they concluded, while neither U.S. landfalling hurricane frequency nor intensity shows any significant trend since 1900, growth in coastal population and wealth have led to increasing hurricane-related damage in the coastline. And the same could be true wildfire risk out in California. We are building and encroaching in areas that have natural risk, not necessarily enhanced risk. And if it is enhanced, so be it. And I think companies recognize that risk of fire and liability and risk to residential construction in LA County where you shouldn't be building. And we've built too much density on America's seacoast potentially. And I think uh, if you look at that, both the lender has that responsibility to disclose that kind of risk and the property and casualty company. And I believe they do that. And I believe our existing prudence uh, in both financial regulation and at the SEC uh, give you that authority right now. So, uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, I'm interested uh, as a CEO and how do what more could we tell? the SEC? If, if people can't measure it, how could the SEC come up with a standard? I'm curious your reflections on that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll wear my hat as someone who is trained as a scientist before going into business. And I, I do believe that we face a, a separate issue that you touched on, which is a, a crisis of public trust in science, that the last thing I would want to see happen is to exacerbate that crisis in part by overstating the certainty of our claims in order to advance a particular agenda when acknowledging that even in the face of uncertainty, we may need to make decisions that with the best of information available, we still need to make. I think that we ought to be transparent about that rather than getting into what I see as a race to the bottom between as we have less than public trust in scientists, the scientific community, you know, including in the climate community, in my opinion, overstate the certainty of their claims as a, assuming that only a fraction of that's gonna be believed when in fact, people then believe even less of it as a consequence. So I think you put your finger on an important issue. Thank you. You go back, Chairman, and thank you for the hearing.
Thank you. And uh, let's go on to Mr. Kasten. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, proud to have served as your temporary substitute chair emeritus today. Um, the, uh, I'm also proud to have uh, worked with Senator Warren on the Climate Risk Disclosure Act and was um, very pleased to see Allison Lee's statement yesterday directing the Division of Corporate Finance to enhance its focus on climate related disclosures. I want to comment a little bit on the, on, I just want to respond a little bit to the comments of my, my good friend, Mr. Hill. Um, there is such a danger in politicizing science. This science is settled, and my goodness, but let us not continue that nonsense any longer. We we know that the earth is warming and we have to do something about it. Mr. Hill also raised this question of materiality. And Mr. Green, I, I just want to ask you a simple question. Who should determine, who should define materiality, investors or management? Quite clear that it needs to be investors and it needs to be uh, clear, simple, standardized disclosures that the SEC determines it should not be left in the hands of management to where, where it's been for far too long and we've seen the results. Quite, well, I, I quite agree. So moving Mr. to Mr. Andrus, as, as a representative of the investor class here today, um, if, if you were given the opportunity to invest in a company that, that didn't much care for GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles and said they wanted to insist on voluntary disclosures for their off balance sheet transactions, would you invest in them? No. Uh, how about if they wanted to use voluntary disclosures for related party transactions? Any red flags there? <laughs> yes, there are red flags there. Okay, can, can, you, can you tell me why you, you would, you know, briefly why you would like those companies to provide consistent standard disclosures? So, because we want, it, we want the truth. So, um, I think what this hearing is about and what we're looking for is basically information. We get that information through honest and fair disclosures. And that's what that's only what we're looking for. And that allows us to make better investment decisions. So, in answering your question, we want to make better investment decisions, and we get that by getting better information. And we here, get that through disclosures. Here, here. So I, I now want to want to agree with my my colleague, Mr. Hesienga, um, that there are real problems with ESG um, as a reporting methodology. I would encourage all of my colleagues, if you haven't read it, to read the CFTC report that recently came out, Managing Climate Risk in the U.S. Financial System. They make the very compelling argument. I think it's an MIT study that there is there is no correlation between ESG rankings, um, even between firms that, that that rank, not because there's a problem with ESG, but because that's a problem with voluntary disclosure methodologies. If everybody disclosed their off balance sheet transactions in a different way, there wouldn't be a correlation. That's a problem. It's not a problem with ESG per se. It's a problem with voluntary disclosures. And so, it, it, and I also just want to really emphasize something. I, I can't stress enough to folks on both sides of the dais because I think I think both of us have maybe all of us have slipped up a little bit. This is not about naming and shaming. This is about connecting risk and reward. If if I have a portfolio of investments and I think I'm overexposed to a given commodity or a given currency or a given industry or a given region, I may want to reweight my portfolio. And maybe I maybe I like the the overall asset holding I have. I want to hedge against it. Ms. Romani, my, my final question is for you. In the absence of consistent, mandatory disclosures of climate impacts, can you quantify the exposure that your portfolio has to a change in climate? And can you identify ways to edge out that risk? Was that question to me, Congressman? Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. Sorry. Um, I, I think that in the absence of consistent, comparable, and reliable information, investors just can't do what they need to do in terms of integrating climate change into their investment analysis. And, and that's the problem that we have right now, Congressman. 30 years ago, when CD started to work on climate and sustainability disclosure, our problem was that companies weren't disclosing. We've solved that problem. Right now, the issue is not with disclosure quantity, it's, di it's with disclosure quality because there are so many standards that companies can use to, to talk about issues like climate change, the information that they're putting out there is not consistent because companies have the ability to pick and choose issues, to pick and choose the ways that they talk about issues. Investors are not getting the information that they consider to be reliable in terms of their investment analysis. And one point that hasn't been raised here before, the vast proportion of climate change disclosures is not externally verified. 
rules for climate change disclosure, I believe, can fix these problems. Well, thank you, and I'm out of time, but I, I, I really appreciate your comments because this is about market efficiency. It's about making sure that inf investors have the right information to understand the risk they face, allocate against those. In other words, it's about making sure that the markets actually accurately price risk, and that shouldn't be partisan. And goodness knows, let's move forward on this. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, just an update. We'll be hearing from Mr. Davidson. I will then go to Mr. Cleaver. And then, unless some other person who is a member of this subcommittee shows up, uh, our final uh, questioner will be uh, Mr. Barr. Uh, Mr. Barr, thank you for joining us for this uh, subcommittee. And uh, if somebody who's actually a member of the subcommittee comes, I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing their wisdom before imparting yours. Mr. Uh, Mr. Davidson, five minutes. I thank the chairman. I thank the uh, ranking member for the committee uh, subcommittee, and I thank our witnesses. I appreciate your testimony today and uh, your presence uh, virtual. Hopefully will one day be restored to physical presence. Uh, Mr. Andrus, in your opening statements, you cited a study that said companies with diverse boards are shown to perform better than those without diverse board boards. If that's the case, isn't this a perfect example of a free market adjusting itself? I mean, if other companies see this, wouldn't it be in their best interest to follow suit? Why would we need the government to tell public companies how to organize and structure their boards uh, if the market will tell them that a diverse board is more um, high performing? So we need, we need to tell boards to diversify to ensure that they use all the talents that's that's available within within the country, and also to mindfully guard against the risks of operating with all white with all white boards. So, it's it's not only that the boards perform better, but if you are sitting on a board, most people aren't going to step down to allow anybody else to to. to so, so, would term limits be just as effective? as these kind of disclosure requirements no 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 they will they will not be other other countries have basically gone basically harder on it and demanded that um women be placed on boards and that has been effective and that has not basically made performance weaken whatsoever well thanks for your answer and i do think that the market shows that that uh, diverse boards can participate and i think Really, one of the big things that, that I think shows is that diverse Not boards are, aren't only uh, encompassed by, uh, you know, the categories that we spend so much time on. Uh, for example, I think it's a great thing that the Supreme Court finally has somebody who didn't go to an Ivy League law school. Uh, that's a form of diversity as well. Um, and look, I would like to just highlight from a practitioner, you know, Mr. Ramaswamy, as you might be aware, in December of 2020, NASDAQ sent a proposed rule to the SEC that would require most NASDAQ listed companies to have or explain why they have not at least two diverse directors. Uh, when you consider this rule taken in conjunction with proposed ESG disclosure requirements, what are the long term effects on our capital markets when a woke so social agenda is imposed on public companies? I mean, at the, some point, is it the shareholder or the stakeholder that is supposed to be represented? So, so I, I would add one further example that's maybe more pertinent to your point, which is one of the largest investment banks in the world announced in January of last year at Davos, at the World Economic Forum, that it would not take any company public if it did not have at least one diverse director when they did not define what one diverse director even meant. It was left to the discretion of this particular investment bank. And you know, I think that one of the issues at, at stake here, even from a disclosure standpoint, if we're going to go down that road, is that diversity of, of metrics that can be measured on a checkbox form, race, gender, so forth, are supposed to have been proxies for diversity of thought. When in fact, the diversity of thought that we bring to the board, the boardroom benefits, I can say from firsthand experience, from diversity of thoughts, from diversity of experiences, from diverse perspectives. But we create a different systemic risk of a different kind by having discharged the responsibility to create a diverse appearance in the boardroom that we may actually foreclose the appearance, the, the actual diversity of thought that skin deep metrics were supposed to serve as a proxy for in the first place. 
And disclosure is going to be a very difficult measure for solving that deeper problem of ensuring diversity of perspectives in the boardroom. I think that at the very least, it would open up a Pandora's box of seeing whether we were representing diverse political perspectives in the boardroom or diverse social perspectives in the boardroom. That's going to be very difficult to capture through any disclosure regime. What yeah, I worry about separately. Uh, let, me, let me just ask quickly, how would you comply with the current ERISA and HR laws uh, to inquire as to whether you've sufficiently diversified a board? I mean, when you look at HR practices, many of the things they're looking for in these disclosures, you can't even ask those questions appropriately in the HR setting. How sexual, orientation is one, sexual orientation is one of those examples that I have some concerns with, where if you are also looking for diversity in terms of sexual orientation in the boardroom, you are also at odds with, with many HR legal and business practices that prohibit asking, asking employees or potential prospective directors about their respective sexual orientation. So that's just one example of where potentially anti-discrimination policy may be in tension with the diversity measures, either from a disclosure perspective or from a state level, for example, in California, a mandated perspective that, that may come into tension with one another. Thanks so much. Really appreciate your comments today and look forward to talking with you on this policy area in the future. I yield. Mr. Cleaver. Is Mr. Cleaver still with us? He was on my screen a second ago. If Mr. Cleaver is not there, I see no other Democrats. What? I, I see uh, no other Democrat. It is a Democrat's turn. I see no other Democrat. Now time for a member of our subcommittee, uh, Mr. Anthony Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. Uh, and thank you to our, our witnesses. Uh, first, I want to reference something. Mr. Kathan, I think, suggested that uh, Mr. Hill uh, was de denying climate change. He, he certainly did not do that. Uh, he, in fact, he, he cited multiple objective data points from government sources uh, and pointed out the fact that climate projections have not been as accurate as some would like. That, that's, not a, that's not climate denial. Uh, he knows I work on climate change in the Science Committee. I think it's a noble, noble goal. Uh, but Mr. Hill was, was simply stating facts. Uh, additionally, uh, comparing the materiality of climate disclosures and gap accounting as if those are somehow the same, uh, and, and we have similar objective measures for both, uh, is, is sort of an interesting uh, thing to suggest. Um, but, uh, but I want to start with something, actually, Mr. Green, you answered earlier, and I think I'm, I'm glad uh, the, po the question was posed this way. The question was posed, uh, who's better for understanding climate risk, investors or managers? Uh, and you said investors. And, I, and um, you know, I, I think that's probably right. I'm sure that we're not talking about that here. This hearing is about government mandates, uh, not investors. And, and so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask Mr. Ramaswani, you've said it once before, uh, as a shareholder in a company, do you have the ability to get disclosures from public companies? Of course, yes, sir, you do. Of course. Um, thank you. Uh, and uh, to, to follow up on a, on a point uh, that, that you made earlier, again, I, I am really concerned about, about the legislation being considered here today um, and using disclosures to address social or moral issues, which, again, I agree that these are all issues we need to solve. I think the question is, do we do this through financial disclosures in the Financial Services Committee, or do we legislate through the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Science Committee? What do you see as the dangers to doing it this way through disclosures and regulation as opposed to through, through the legislative process? I think you've stated it really well. I'd love to again. Well, to, to build on a couple of points that I've made without repeating the points that I've already made, I'll add two more to my, to my oral opening statement, which are as follows. I think first is, using disclosure as a low resolution blunt instrument to accomplish potentially worthy social goals may actually be a disservice both to the social goals as well as to the underlying actual uh, capital formation objectives of the financial disclosure regime in the first place. I, I stated earlier that with respect to the latter, you would tend to favor industry incumbents over smaller startup companies. One disclosure alone isn't going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back, but collectively, if you apply an equivalent standard to, do, to include mandatory disclosures of equivalent materiality to say climate related disclosures, that collectively could be many, many more straws that do break that camel's back for the startup. On the other hand, you also have the, the inability to actually precisely allow firms, even if you're coming at this issue from the standpoint of a climate activist, for 
firms to be able to discharge their responsibilities simply by complying with the minimalist standards of disclosure. And I think that whether this is a conservative concern or a liberal concern, I don't know. But from both angles, I worry that disclosure is too blunt of, and low resolution of an instrument to actually effectuate the end itself, rather than acknowledging that what might be at issue here isn't really about protecting investors, but about dealing with relevant social issues, doing that through the front door, transparently through public debate, by the way, in a way that I believe would enhance public trust in the process of what we're actually accomplishing, rather than indirectly adjudicating these issues through the back door of disclosure and enforcing those into, through our public companies. There's one more concern I'd like to address, but it, but I'll uh, yield please. my time back to you. I know, please. Okay, so, so the second concern, the other class of concerns that we haven't touched on today that I think is important is a risk factor on the global stage from a geopolitical perspective. Everything that we're talking about here is for U.S. public companies or for public companies that have reporting requirements in the United States. Let's acknowledge that there's a growing base of companies in China and in other parts of the world, but in China in particular, where there are no such mandatory reporting requirements. And I think that this entire ESG movement is in fact a geopolitical boon to China in the following way. By requiring US companies to own up to the negative externalities that they contribute to, but not requiring the same regime of companies abroad in China, we are creating a false moral equivalence or worse between the work of companies and actors here in the United States versus those in, in dictatorial regimes in places like China. And I, I believe that the Chinese government and other great power rivals on the world stage understand this phenomenon well to be able to know that our greatest asset is not our nuclear arsenal, but is our moral standing on the global stage. And when the same actors and the same companies criticize both public policy here in the United States, as well as their own behavior, be it Disney or the NBA or Marriott, but remain silent to, to true macro aggressions in China, that disparity is actually part of what undercuts our moral standing on the global stage. And so the link between stakeholder capitalism and geopolitics is something that I think hasn't been investigated enough. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. Nice to back. Uh, seeing no Democrat, uh, I will recognize another Republican, and uh, I will commend Mr. Barr for his patience, but I will commend Mr. Style for his decision to choose to serve on our subcommittee and recognize him first. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Appreciate uh, you holding today's hearing. Uh, Vivek R R Ramaswamy, really appreciate your last comments about the importance of United States global competitiveness and how placing burdens on US-based publicly traded companies uniquely vis-a-vis -vis non publicly traded companies, but most importantly, vis-a-vis -vis foreign companies places such a disadvantage on US companies and ultimately on US workers and US consumers. I, I thought that your last comment uh, was very strong. As many of my colleagues know, and as you may know, I've been very concerned about proposals that would really erode the tried and true principle of materiality, in particular as it relates to ESG disclosures on these US publicly traded companies, uh, I'd argue that our existing materiality standards actually serves investors quite well. Uh, if information on climate change, diversity, or other common ESG metrics is material, I, I agree, it should be disclosed. I think the question is whether or not the SEC should deem that issue itself material. Uh, and in deeming these de facto, if in deeming these de facto, these issues material, I think it could really drive up confusion, drive up compliance costs, uh, discourage businesses from going public, and puts us at a competitive disadvantage against global competitors, uh, and as you correctly noted, vis-a-vis uh, -vis China in particular. Uh, the SEC's mission, uh, as we're well aware, is to protect investors facilitate capital formation, maintain fair and orderly and efficient markets. Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, uh, would you agree that mandatory ESG disclosures, irregardless of materiality, run contrary to the mission of the SEC and the goal of our securities laws? So I am not a securities law expert, uh, though I'm trained as a lawyer. I think you all may be greater experts than I on that topic. But it, as I understand it, as both a, a someone who has lived under the regime of the SEC as well as has studied it, I, I believe that the mandate of the agency ought to be constrained to protecting investors, not because other objectives aren't important, but because other agencies or other bodies may be better suited to look after the underlying content of concerns and instead allow the SEC to do its per, do its job well of requiring investors to have the information they need to make sound decisions and to be protected in the process. Now, I, I, I do believe that, if, if I may, I think that 
the two points that I would raise is if we if there's a discussion about ESG related disclosures in that discussion has to be included the idea of a point that I raised in my opening statement, which was the non financial conflicts of interest of a CEO. It's well established that if the SEC is going to look after one class of disclosures above those of any other, it is the conflicts of interest of the people who lead our public companies versus the principal agent conflicts they may experience relative to the shareholders who they are supposed to represent. And I worry that the social causes and, and even the well-intentioned social motivations of many of these CEOs, including but not limited to in Silicon Valley, today are in tension with the underlying objectives of their shareholders in ways that at least ought to be disclosed. I gave the analogy earlier of someone donating to their I'm, high school. I'm going to jump back in. This is a little, little challenging virtually. You can't. I mean, let me jump back in because I, sure. only, I only have so much time left. And I want to get you on another topic that I think is really important. It, you spoke, I think, very eloquently about how these non-material ESG metrics can burden companies in the United States vis-a-vis -vis international competition. I think another area that's worth noting is the impact that this has on large companies versus small companies. Large publicly traded companies in the United States may have large compliance teams, large uh, legal operations to be able to navigate through some of this. Can you speak to how these types of non-material disclosures would burden some of the smaller emerging growth publicly traded companies in the United States? They, they would very much help big four accounting firms that ultimately are responsible for administering these requirements for companies that want to go public, for, for lawyers and investment bankers who ultimately serve as gatekeepers for taking companies public. But they would be an added cost on an already costly process for startup companies that do want to go public. And, and in closing, I think that one guardrail to your point about the internationalism of this is a point for consideration for the members of this committee might be to say that at least if you're going to adopt a mandatory form of disclosure, for example, on climate related disclosures, whether to consider a minimum constraint of whether foreign equal foreign powers like in China are willing to adopt similar constraints equivalently so that we don't undermine the competitiveness of companies, both large and small. Let me, the global let, me, let, me, let me jump in for the final 10 seconds. I like your thought. We need to look at emerging growth companies in the United States, make sure we're lowering those burdens and making sure that the, that benefit is to United States companies, not foreign companies. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I request unanimous consent uh, to submit for the record a letter from the FACT Coalition in support of Ms. Axney's Disclosure of Tax Havens and Offshoring Act and uh, Country by Country uh, Tax Disclosure. Uh, I uh, see only one member who hasn't uh, spoken, and that is uh, uh, our, our friend from the full committee, uh, Mr. Barr, I will recognize him. And uh, unless another member comes in, I will then uh, recognize Mr. Huizinga for one minute. Mr. Barr. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to wave on to uh, this subcommittee and, and ranking member Huizinga, thank you as well. And to our witnesses, thank you for uh, the vigorous uh, conversation, interesting indeed and timely. Uh, I have to say, I wanted to, uh, uh, listen to the testimony because I have been very alarmed by the growing trend of politicization of access to capital. Over the last several years, we have witnessed financial firms publicly commit not to do business with certain legal companies in politically unpopular industries like the fossil energy sector. And these decisions were not based on the creditworthiness or the financial soundness of the borrower, but rather were driven by a number of non-pecuniary factors political pressure from vocal critics, public relations pressure from activist groups, the moral judgment of corporate leadership all contributed. But none, none of those factors should play a role in determining which legally operating business receives a loan from a bank or gets investments through retirement funds or is sold a commercial insurance policy. Any decision should be explicitly and exclusively dependent on objective risk-based underwriting standards. The politicization of access to capital threatens jobs and compromises entire industries based on the misguided opinions of a select few. If you would allow me uh, the indulgence of just making one final editorial comment before my questions, and that is I do not believe that this ESG movement is in any way about managing climate-related fi financial stress. What I believe this is really about is about causing financial stress, causing financial distress for particularly politically incorrect industries. The coal industry in my home state of Kentucky being a prominent example, a victim and the workers therein a victim uh, 
of political correctness and the politicization of access to capital. And these mandatory climate disclosures are about are not about providing material information to investors. They are about the government putting its heavy hand on the scale to discriminate against certain legally operating businesses to pick winners and losers in the marketplace and to politicize access to capital. In case you didn't know where I stood, uh, I did want to just make that comment. I, I do think individuals should have the freedom to contribute their resources to political, social, charitable causes. I think it's fine. If someone wants to invest in an ESG fund or invest in a climate related cause with their own dime, but that's the individual's choice. When such choices are made for shareholders by agents acting at the corporate level, using the investor's own capital, then at best we are inviting abuse, resource misallocation, malfeasance, and inefficiency. But at worst, we are enabling a practice that looks a lot like theft theft from shareholders and investors, the actual owners of the corporation by corporate directors and officers, either voluntarily or through government mandate, and redirecting their money, their money, and their resources away from the core mission of the company and into an unrelated political errand. That to me is immoral, it is offensive. Mr. Uh, Ramaswamy, in your opinion, should the moral judgments of investment managers, banks, and other financial firms dictate which legally operating firms get financing, especially if those opinions are based on unrelated social causes? With, with all due respect, I do not. And, and I think that that is a source of, that is a conflict of interest that I believe is more material to investors than any of the other social factors that we have discussed today. Because if there's one thing that protects the integrity of our public capital markets, it is making sure that investors are aware of the conflicts that a given CEO or manager bears when making decisions using shareholder capital. And if what? a manager is gonna use shareholder capital to burnish their personal reputational brand or, or burnish their own social causes at the expense of other social causes, investors ought to know about that sooner than they ought to about other broader social related climate risks or other. Mr. Ramaswamy, last question here. Uh, in terms of investor returns, I have no issue if investors choose to allocate their money to ESG funds if there's transparency and if there's a mar if there's an appetite for them, um, but I have a problem uh, to asset managers who exclusively offer ESG options and limit customers' options to invest in in fossil energy, for example, as an alternative. Uh, do you agree that investment advisors and retirement plan sponsors should advise their clients based on what will drive the highest returns, or, or make clients aware if non-financial factors are driving particular asset allocation or investment advice? I do worry that the investors are getting hosed because uh, asset managers are, are politicizing the allocation of their, their, their capital as opposed to maximizing shareholder uh, value. I, I agree with your comments and I believe that that's actually a relevant area for future inquiry with respect to disclosure requirements. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to wave on. And, and I, as you can tell, I'm interested in this topic and I yield back. Thank you. We uh, now go to uh, from a member who isn't a member of the subcommittee to the chairwoman who is a member of every subcommittee. Ms. Water. Uh, thank you very much, um, Congressman Chairman, uh, for holding uh, this meeting. This is so very important. We're just getting into all of the ways by which we can deal with the whole issue of climate change. Uh, but I'd like to ask a question uh, regarding climate change on communities of uh, the impacts of climate change on communities of color and climate risk at this closure. Ms. Tony, may I address this question to you? Series of segregationists and other racist policies have left communities of color, particularly black communities, disproportionately vulnerable to the physical and health risk of climate change. For far too long, this important topic has been left out of the conversation. Reports coming from Texas show that Black and Latinx communities have been hit the hardest during Texas historic freeze, compounding the disproportionate damage done to these same communities from increased extreme weather events like hurricanes and flooding. Drawing on your extensive experience, uh, as an environmental regulator, an environmental justice advocate, and as the former mayor of a major minority city, can you please discuss how corporate disclosures of climate risk can help communities and government better access the risk their communities face and help them take action to address these risks? 
Chairwoman, absolutely. The the impact comes very hard and heavy. And it's been interesting listening to this dialogue because we've talked ad nauseum about how investors are impacted and whether or not this is a moral decision without realizing that some of the decisions that are made and the lack of disclosure is a decision in and of itself. The labor force that's working in these places, investors need to know whether or not the climate impacts of how people are actually out gathering food, if it's a food company, um, how that happens and that particular marginalized community. And they're making these decisions right now. The companies know, for example, uh, airlines are looking at climate to determine how the jet stream goes and how the future of infrastructure needs to be designed with respect to um, air, uh, uh, um, the air traffic ways and to the runways when we're thinking about how something like coffee beans are grown or where water disparities are in our country. These are issues that are impacted by climate. These are issues where the labor force is often black and brown. These are places where the assets of the company are located in black and brown communities. And investors need to know whether or not the climate impact and the disproportionate nature to communities of color will impact their bottom dollar. This is another important thing that I put into the testimony, and I hope everyone has an opportunity to read. There is a study that's been done by Rice University and the University of Pittsburgh that shows specific evidence that once a climate disaster happens, white counties actually increase in terms of their average wealth, while black and brown um, counties decrease. There is a increase in the economic disparity when after climate disasters, investment is not done. And it's historic and it's systemic. This is not new to the federal government. HUD, FEMA, EPA, these are all regulatory agencies from the federal government and the SEC is no different. So we must consider these um, as we talk about this issue. And last point, um, Chairwoman, if, if you will allow me, I think it's interesting to note that sometimes we tend to think that we're starting from a place of equality and we are not. Black and brown communities are coming from the back. It would be lovely if we were all starting from a place of one person, one vote, but that's just not true. That's not our democracy. It is not our history. We are trying hard to come back and restore what should be happening. And that is what the Biden administration has said. And I think the way that they have outlined this in a way that we use climate as a, as a, as a bridge to equality is an opportunity that we have never had in our country. And I'm hopeful that we can all get on the same page. Wow, I love that statement and I'm going to quote you, climate as a bridge to equality. Thank you very much. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Thank Madam you, Chair. Chair. Uh, for a closing one minute, I, represent, I uh, recognize uh, Mr. Huizinga. Uh, Chairman um, and uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, if you're still on, I'm looking forward to your book that's upcoming, uh, Woke Inc. Um, you know, despite claims that this is not about naming and shaming, uh, pretty clearly it is. Uh, political spending is naming and shaming. Diversity disclosure on sexual orientation and family status is naming and shaming. Pay structure, tax structures. Um, and, and just because many of us oppose government mandated uh, non-material disclosures does not mean that we aren't concerned about these particular issues. What the question, main question, and it should be, does this make us more competitive and attractive in a global economy? Uh, large companies may be able to handle this, but this is going to damage small and medium-sized companies, especially those startups. And this bill, the sets this issue, is dealing with U.S. public companies, not privately held companies, not foreign companies. And it begs the question, when will the push start to include privately held companies as well? That is the slippery slope of this issue. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ramaswamy, I want to thank you for uh, focusing our attention on how a study of the history of the Dutch East India Company can inform modern decision making. Uh, you point out that uh, we want a system of one person, one vote. Unfortunately, we live in a world where a corporate board can spend millions of dollars overwhelming my one vote at the ballot box. McCain-Feingold was designed to prevent that. At a minimum, we could force disclosure. Um, you indicate that disclosure is a blunt instrument. It is actually the least blunt instrument. Uh, the second least would be to tax or subsidize a behavior 
and the most blunt would be to prohibit or require a behavior. I think it's uh, it may be unfair to public companies that we force these disclosures only on them. And I go happily go down that slippery slope and say the disclosure should be of all large companies, and we might even exclude a few of the smallest uh, public companies. And finally, I do not think it is theft when a corporation uh, that I might be a shareholder in spends money on planting trees, weatherizing a facility, or otherwise uh, uh, reducing its effect on global warming. I do think it's theft when the company spends its money secretly on a political cause opposed to my interest and won't even reveal it. Uh, with that, uh, we uh, stand adjourned. Thank you. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions to the, uh, to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask witnesses to please respond as promptly as possible. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days uh, within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion of the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to FSC documents. That stands for Financial Services Committee documents at mail.house.gov. And now we're adjourned. Thank you.